Are you ready to perform at your highest potential? Thank you for joining this GP Strategies webinar, where we'll explore best practices and innovative insights to help you and your organization improve performance. Let's just start by saying good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everyone who's joining us today. We have a great discussion today on five technology change management trends to watch out for in 2024 with our <laughs> presenter, Julian Lee, um, self-proclaimed GOAT. So <laughs> let's my, just go to that slide. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my name is Kim Hire. I'm with GP Strategies, and I'm really happy to be your host for today's session. So um, I just want to cover a few things before I introduce Julian, and that is, as everybody should know, or if you've joined us before, we always follow up with a recording to today's presentation. It comes from me, and you should get it within 24 to 48 hours. And as always, even though our lines are muted, we always want our time together to be as interactive as possible. So if you have any comments, for the during the presentation for the presenter or your fellow attendees today please use the chat feature um, if you don't have access to the chat function you can use it hand um, use the reaction uh, emojis or add it to your q a section but if you do have any really specific questions for julian um, use the q a option as well because it'll be easier for us to process your questions and make sure that we respond to them during today's webinar so again, thank you all for joining our session today, and I'm really excited to introduce you to today's presenter. So Julian Lee is a self-proclaimed GOAT and a certified change management practitioner with over 30 years of experience successfully delivering change solutions to a broad spectrum of clients across multiple industries. So again, thank you all for joining us. We appreciate your time. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it off to you, uh, Julian. And also, Joan wants to know what GOAT means. I was just about to respond to that. <laughs> thank you. That's a good question. Uh, and uh, the the right nomenclature is the self, not a. The a sounds a little weird. Is the self-proclaimed GOAT. GOAT right. stands for greatest of all times. That was a phrase coined by Muhammad Ali, uh, should you care uh, the history of that term, that terminology. So the greatest of all time, but I want a caveat, is self-proclaimed, right? <laughs> so that's what uh, the GOAT means. All right. Thanks for your questions. And thanks for joining us for uh, the first webinar for 2024 uh, that I uh, had the opportunity to do. And what we're going to do is talk about <clears throat> the trends that I see for 2024 for organizational change management. Um, we're going to jump into these here shortly, but we're going to talk about the state of organizational change management. I like to always intro and lead in with that. So we can get a flavor of what uh, change management is and what it's about and some of the nuances of it. And then we'll jump right into each one of the five trends that I have identified here on the screen here. And we're going to wrap it up and have some Q&A. So sit back and enjoy and chime in and uh, engage. All right. The state of change management. This number. Um, if I've been doing this for a while, and I think this number is uh, trickling up, if I can say that uh, uh, correctly. We're at 75% of all ERP projects fail or don't, or I say don't, they fail. Maybe they don't reach their intended outcome. And that's a source from Forbes from 2021. So it'd be interesting to see what this number is today uh, as we're going into 2024. Uh, it could be significantly higher based on some of the trends I've seen with projects um, uh, that's being implemented and some of the struggles that organizations are having. This number could be, potentially be a little bit higher than what it is today. Have to do a little research on that. If anyone has any uh, additional information and like to share that, that'd be outstanding. Again, I like to highlight why we do change management. And if you had a chance to sit in on any of my other webinars, I always have this slide available. And it speaks to the value of change management. I've been doing change management since 1992. So that's a while. I've been around a while. And it's important for us to have a, a uh, tangible um, measurement to show that change management makes a difference. This study provides that measurement, and that's why I like to lead off with this one. <clears throat> it was conducted by McKinsey, and 
they used 40 different companies that were implementing some type of change, culture change, technology change, uh, maybe been some digital transformation going on at that time. And they evaluated these 40 companies based on the criteria you see at the top. Uh, whether senior managers were committed, where middle managers had decision making and so forth, and how the frontline staff reacted during time, times of change. So these 12 factors uh, are the things that they looked at at these three organizational levels to evaluate the effectiveness of change management. So here's the outcome. 11 of the 40 companies that had zero uh, had, had uh, total effectiveness at all three levels. So they were they were not ineffective at any level within the organization, uh, within these three uh, areas here. They got 143% of expected value. So in other words, senior managers were doing what they're supposed to do. Middle managers uh, were were following suit and the frontline staff were uh, were doing the things they were supposed to do in, help, in helping these organizations get through the change. When they have uh, effectiveness at all three levels, that's the outcome, 143%. Seven companies that may have had one of these areas not to go as well as they thought it would got 129%. So the moral of the story is effective change management pays, but you don't have to be totally effective at it. And there's an opportunity to get your value from your projects if you have change management as a part of it. 11 companies that only hit at one level uh, of effectiveness, maybe the senior managers did what they were supposed to do, but it didn't trickle down through the organization, only got 68%. And then 11 companies that had 0% effectiveness at any of these levels within the organization got 35% of expected value. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I beg the question is, where would you want to be? 11 uh, companies that hit at all three of these levels at 143% sounds like a good bogey for us to shoot for uh, uh, as we implement these technology projects and have organizational change management be a part of it. So that's the state of change management. Now, let's go into the to, to my uh, opinion of what the five technology change management trends are for 2024. Let's jump into number one. Digital transformation and agile methodologies. <clears throat> Excuse me. As we move forward in today's competitive environment, the digital transformation uh, landscape has changed dramatically and will change dramatically in my interpretation over 2024. These methodologies are, are becoming core pieces of strategy and how organizations are forming themselves in, uh, or transforming themselves in order to be more competitive and to, to be more agile in this very, very competitive world that we're in. Some of these digital transformation methodologies include uh, the technology adoption, uh, uh, introducing new technologies to improve and increase and make you faster, better, and put you in a, in a competitive advantage. So the technology ado adoption is a critical piece for transformation to be successful. Some require a huge culture shift as well. You can't do things the way that you used to do. We have to reshape the culture in this digital transformation world. So as 2024 unfolds, I anticipate that you'll see more uh, digital transformation type um, uh, projects or, or uh, uh, enterprise level engagements that, are happen that happens with these organizations in order to become more effective and become more efficient. The establishment of these cross-functional teams are going to be a critical piece for digital transformation to be successful as well. So when you're establishing cross-functional teams, the important thing to note about that is that these teams have to be agile. So the agility of these teams to be effective when these new technologies are rolled out is going to be highly important. And that moves to the to the um, to the next column over here, the text box, where we talk about the methodology of being agile and 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 having some agility. Uh, during this whole digital transformation process. Collaboration, adaptability, customer focus are just three key points that are important when we talk about agility and we talk about uh, having an approach and an agile uh, mindset. So <clears throat> the, the point I want to make here is that when we start these projects or when we start digital transformation, if agility is the key to these being successful, it's going to be vitally important that 
the people that are managing these projects and that are doing this work have some foundational uh, grounding around what it means to be agile some form of training, some form of coaching of how to have an agile mindset because people will tend to shift to their old way of thinking and old way of executing when agility is needed. So it's important to understand that if we're going to move uh, to some form of agile, whether it's a deployment uh, methodology uh, or we, we need agility in our organization, we need people to be trained on how to be agile and have an agile mindset and also how to work in an agile deployment uh, model uh, from a uh, execution perspective for the technology projects. So <clears throat> what's the key to technology adoption and, and agility? Again, embrace that agile change management mindset, adjust your change management models where it fits any agile approach that you might be using. Have those cross-functional uh, teams be in place and have the collaboration. Have agile leadership. The leadership has to display and has to show and have and be visible that agility is a part of the process. Uh, the iterative planning and feedback, that's all a part of, of agile. The communication is important, having flexibility. Having those change champions and establishing advocates with that, uh, throughout the organization is a critical piece that's going to be important as we look to these digital transformations being successful. And the, and the rest that you see, adaptive documentation, risk management, contingency planning, and measure and adapt. If things are not going as planned, determine that through your, your measurement criteria, and then if not, adapt to, to uh, what it takes to be successful. That's the whole aspect of agility in this era of uh, digital transformation. So let's look at number two, employee-centric approach. This involves active engagement at all levels within the organization. For technology implementation to be successful, uh, it relies on people. It's important that we have early and transparent communications with all folks that are involved in, 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 the, in a change effort or technology solution. Uh, in, include people in decision-making as much as possible and then have some, some um, uh, flexibility when it comes to timelines. Most of the time, and people are, are doing their day jobs and they're on these projects and they're trying to contribute to the success of these technology implementations, but they still have a day job. Uh, it's not like the old days. And if if some of you were around way back when, when we would pull people off project, uh, excuse me, off their day-to-day -day work and put them on projects and that was their full-time responsibility, that doesn't happen anymore. So we have to be flexible with, with implementation timelines and not be so rigid that we have to meet this deadline and we have to meet this, this, this uh, specific timeline. Uh, the feedback channels are important. Key to employee engagement is this recognition and, and celebration. I know a lot of times we're living in this virtual world and we do a lot of remote. We're gonna talk a little bit about that, um, what, what the, 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 the remote world looks like. But at any rate, if you could have some kind of recognition and celebrations of the people's contribution to these technology implementations going into 2024, that's gonna make the people-centric, the people aspect of, of uh, technology solutions and implementations that much more robust. A real key, and I'm experiencing this in, in both spectrums uh, on both sides of the uh, of the continuum here, is post-implementation support. Now, I've seen projects that go live and with an assumption that the post-implementation support was going to be there based on some parameters that they set in place uh, with a certain group of individuals that they thought would just take on that role. And I've seen the converse of that, the total opposite of the pendulum, where a structured, methodical approach to post go live support was put in place, checking all the boxes to ensure that the user experience was as high as it could possibly be, and that adoption occurred at the highest level because they had the right level of support. So you think about when you implement a new system, new technologies come into play, the last thing you want to do is have a negative experience from the people that's using the system. You've carried them through the change and all of a sudden, now the system, or they can't, the system doesn't work as it should. They can't find the support that they need. That's a critical uh, failure point in my mind. 
that uh, allows uh, adoption not to reach its full potential. So it's important to set up those post uh, go lab support mechanisms and processes to ensure success. Also, key this is this is an upcoming trend: uh, wellness and, and work life balance considerations. All the aspects that that people are going through with these projects is changing their, their their way of being at work. So that has to have some impact on them personally and could be actually physically. So we have to be aware that change causes uh, uh, some scenarios to, to occur that that we have to be very cognizant and pay close attention to wellness and work-life balance to ensure that we, we have people exactly where we need to be when we roll these technologies out uh, over 2024 and beyond. And then key, measure your employee success, right? A lot of times I've seen success, um, uh, excuse me, uh, satisfaction criteria or satisfaction uh, surveys go out, but a lot of times they don't go out at the time of an implementation. Measure your uh, employee satisfaction and also measure the adoption of these solutions so you can determine if you're reaching those goals, if you're getting to that 143%, right? It's important to do those things as we look into the trends of 2024. These are the things to focus on from a, uh, a technology implementation and in having uh, the right level of engagement. Number three, near and dear to my heart, data-driven decision-making. Fought long and hard for a long time. I've been in change management since 1992. I think I mentioned it earlier. Back when it was a lot less uh, um, robust. I'll just use that word. And now it seems to to have picked up some, some momentum and people really understand the value of it. But still, we have to rely on data to give us uh, the metrics and let, that, let the data speak for itself as we roll out these new technologies. You want to always focus your change efforts, these projects that come out uh, that that are deployed, that are are part of a strategic uh, goal of an organization. Define those key performance indicators. Always conduct a baseline assessment so you know exactly where you are from a people readiness perspective. Now, these KPIs may exist for the, the ROI for the business. We want to tie change management KPIs to those as well. Use uh, any technology uh, available to collect your data. Uh, SurveyMonkey, any of the tools within Microsoft to collect data that will tabulate and give you those graphical depictions of that output. Monitor continuously. We take people through our continuum of, of awareness, personal understanding, uh, excuse me, general understanding, personal understanding. Measure continuously up that continuum till you get to adoption to determine how you're trending uh, well, from a change perspective. So the data that you receive are things you can react to. Also, you can benchmark some industry standards. There are studies, there's information out there that shows where certain projects are and how they are, are progressing. So you can get that, that criteria uh, that's required to determine if you're trending in the right direction. Also, be very, very uh inclusive in sharing your information. Communicate those data insights. Let the organization know where you are in terms of uh, of those trends and where we are and what, what uh, it's going to take to close gaps or leverage people's uh, momentum. And that's the last bullet. Uh, respond accordingly to the results. Show actions that that these, um, uh, uh, these data trends or the, what you're collecting is something you can respond to. Vitally important to do that. Uh, it looks like we have a question. Do we want to get to that question now? Yep, it's up to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you, uh, hold on a second. Um, the question is that they heard from leadership of a small tech company that they were too small to be agile, that this mindset and framework were adequate only for bigger organizations or teams. How can you tackle change of the change management place? plan in this case? Sorry. That's a very interesting question. Um, obviously, the the agile mindset or the agile approach has to come from the top. 
we can't infuse it and have it work um, uh, at this level at a at a micro level when it needs to be at the macro level. So that's going to be challenging. Now, I've seen projects that would try to implement, uh, and I'll just go to the technology um, uh, solution or technology deployment piece where they they use a hybrid model uh, from a execution perspective or deployment perspective. Those are challenging as well. The only thing I could I could say is that if it's proven, if we can prove that, I say we like I'm a part of this, if we can prove that the agile mindset will be the, the biggest asset to the deployment of the solution being effective and that a shift in people's mindset is going to uh, lead us to a greater opportunity for this project to get off the ground and do what it's supposed to do. I would make the strong case for that. Now, there are there are no hard parameters or guidelines that says a project has to be in an agile delivery model or use an agile mindset versus the waterfall. It's gonna be what's best for the organization and how you can uh, uh, prove that whichever delivery model or approach that you put forth is gonna give us the best opportunity for the success of the project. I've seen projects start out one way and then shift to another, start out waterfall, shift to agile, start out agile, shift to waterfall, primarily because it, it was determined that whatever the shift was made, that the opportunity to succeed lended itself more towards the the the, the methodology or the de deployment model that they were moving to. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that answered, answered the question. Uh, there's no hard and fast way of making that happen except for uh, just having some hard conversations about how success uh, is going to be measured and how how we can be successful as an organization, regardless of the size. Now, size size will will have some factors in the amount of teams you can have and the amount of engagement that that that's required. So it's a tough decision, and hopefully that 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 answered your question. Yeah, actually, there was a similar question that was in the chat. <laughs> that I think may you may have answered um, and just about being agile with uncertain projects and you know um, being suffering with large scale communication as the process and tools change to update quickly. So they were asking to comment on that. And I think that kind of, you just answered that with um, the, the question that was in the Q and A from um, Louise. Excellent. Um, there are t there is another question in there if you want to take it or you want to. That's hey, I like this. Let's keep going. Okay, so <laughs> what do you think of organizational <laughs> network analysis used identifying influencers in change management? I think it's vitally important, right? And I, somebody may be looking at these slides because I'm going to share with you uh, this so one slide, <laughs> this one slide, I'm gonna answer the question, the next slide, and I'm gonna answer the question at the same time. Okay, um, great. <laughs> a part of the, the data-centric decision-making is collecting data. So for that question, I highly recommend using any tools or mechanisms to determine uh, the, the, the impact key individuals might have on a project, and I say impact. One organization right now, I'm using a, a, a process or one of the tools that, that I have that looks at um, a particular individual stakeholder and that we're looking at the level of effort that it's going to take that individual to, to make the change happen and their influence. Those two factors will determine whether uh, what type of, of attention, I'll use that word, that they will require as you move forward during the implementation. If a person has a high level of effort, uh, put, forth a high, put forth a high level of effort and have a high level of influence, <clears throat> you want to monitor them closely. And whatever your, your stakeholder engagement plan is, you take that into consideration because they have the uh, opportunity, the propensity, or the, the um, possibility of influencing that outcome of that uh, project. Now, that outcome could be positive or could be negative. So it's important to understand what some of the concerns, those specific uh, concerns, issues, or or um, uh, levels of excitement that might exist for that particular stakeholder. But definitely measure the the uh, uh, some people call it impact, influence, effort, influence. Um, so those are the things you want to 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 capture 
as you determine your 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 metrics and let that data drive your engagement plans going forward. Oops, that answered that question. Hopefully, um, but what I'm sharing here is is a uh, a metric that that I like to use. That highlights uh, you know, understanding readiness by departments. And you see that we have a criteria here on the left that looks at awareness, acceptance, knowledge, and proficiency. And for each one of the departments, I keyed in this information and it gave me uh, the, the resulting plan. Uh, so for, for plan, for, and this is the one just for department two, it gave me this particular plan that I could now uh, turn and and take action on. So when I said the data, collecting the data, and then responding to that data in some form of action is vitally important. Here's a mechanism you can do that. And these are the things that you can actually do so you can ensure that you are addressing uh, some of the readiness gaps that you might see. And if if it was just the opposite, if everything was on the high side, you would leverage that that readiness enthusiasm. So your plan would look totally different. And I think we're going to share that link with everybody in a follow-up email. Is that right? Exactly. To we're going to do that. There's a resource for this. Uh, and I fall back on this group uh, quite often. It's called OCM Solutions. I'll just put it out there. I have a great working relationship with them. And they provide these tools and, 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 and uh, uh, technology uh, that will allow you to do these kinds of assessments and collect data. So that's that's where that's where this comes from. I dropped it in the chat for everybody. You're easy. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. So what about this hybrid workforce number four? If you think about it, we've been in a hybrid scenario now. Uh, I guess since the, the since the pandemic uh, ended. Um, some form of a hybrid workforce. Uh, so it's important for us as we look at the technology implementations that we're doing across the enterprise and across our companies that we determine the, the importance of the hybrid workforce and how this could uh, impede our ability. Oh, did that just pop up? Is that me on? Oh, is this, the, the poll is going. I opened the poll. Okay, great people to answer what is their current situation yeah this is interesting i like this live uh remote in office in office is still lagging forgive it about 20 seconds 30 seconds people want to contribute to the poll we find it interesting and then we'll share the results So we've shifted from back in the day during the pandemic, uh, obviously when a lot of us were remote, but now we're tired. Hybrid and remote still about the same. And office is still uh, uh, lagging as well. Well, the important thing uh, is that we understand that when, when we're implementing new technologies and changes are occurring, that flexibility matters. And if we if we choose a certain model, we have to be ensured that that model, when an organization chooses a certain working model, that that model gives you the best opportunity for your project to be successful. You take all those things into consideration as you uh, collect the, uh, uh, the understanding of what people want to experience from a uh, working environment. It's going to be highly important that the collaboration exists that even in a virtual world, and I think we've mastered that these days uh, uh, where we can be just as effective in a virtual world. But then there's organizations that do want that hybrid approach that allows them a touch point where they can actually come together and have meetings uh, in-house and, and, um, and, and still get work done. So we move to, I think I have to make this go away to get to my next slide. So, as I stated, we've been at this for a while. So I'm advocating that we just continue to incorporate flexible communication channels, any collaboration tools that, that exist. There are, we are experiencing one right now with, with Zoom. There's Teams, there are other ones out there that are coming forth that, that could make uh, collaborating being together uh, most important. 
Uh, one thing I, I noticed that could, could really be um, a trend that could make things more effective in this hybrid work model is if you're doing remote work, make the remote onboarding and support more robust. Uh, I've know I've know of instances, and it may happen in house as well. But if you're remote, you're kind of out on an island. And if you're onboarding onto a project, a technology project, and you need hardware or you need access, that that needs to occur as soon as possible. That affects a person's ability to do the work they need to do. Affects their ability to be effective in in their in the work that they need to do. So it's important to make those uh, onboarding processes as effective as possible and giving people the tools that they need. So as you move into 2024, you can have your remote uh, uh, resources be as effective as possible. And uh, obviously, if you're on site having hybrid uh, uh, collaboration spaces, performance metrics, have we has there been a study to say which one's more effective than the other? Maybe interesting to see uh, where the productivity lies. And then Never forget team building. Even in a virtual world, you can have a virtual happy hour. I've had a few of those. Uh, but it's important that you have some camaraderie that takes place. Right. But I'd like to performance metrics. Let's 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 talk about that. Uh, do we have a poll for uh, I think I'm leading in, in into Kim's space here, but we had a poll right that talks about uh, the performance between these these three models. I don't. Oh, sorry, I don't. Have I only had the one, but we can ask it in chat. Oh, yeah. in chat. Now I'm sorry, yeah, it's not a poll. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I right. went off script. I went off script. <laughs> <You're true>. <laughs> 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 it's not a poll. It's chat. Okay, please tell us um, where you're most productive. Where are you most productive? What 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 settings do you got? Hybrid. You have remote, and you have in office. Tell us uh, in in the chat, please, where where you feel like you're the most productive. We'll just we'll we'll I want to see those numbers go up. Yeah. Well, Shawana said that hybrid. She likes it because it's a nice collaboration with working with others. Okay. Look at that. Yeah, coming in. Remote. I will. You know, I've been working, Julian. I've been working remote for ten years. I haven't been in an office, and I find it very productive. My my drive to work is six steps or something. I don't know. <laughs> well, I live in Houston, so uh, I'm going to say remote work for me is most uh, uh, productive because I could spend an hour plus trying to get to an office somewhere when I uh, I have an upstairs office. I have a one story commute versus an hour sitting on 290. If anyone is aware of that mess. Mm -hmm. and, uh, no snow days, Joan. Nope. That was... That was fun when the kids were little. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of remote, not a lot of fanfare for the in office. I'm just saying. <laughs> now, I know that may be a topic for another uh, discussion, but that's interesting. That's an interesting shift that that people made, uh, a change that people made. And there may have been some resistance towards that but uh, in the beginning, but it was a necessary change. So it's interesting to see that that organizations or may not be reverting back to to that scenario or people don't find it as effective as they used to be because they've they've uh, determined that they can be just as effective in this hybrid model or or in a remote setting so that's interesting all righty how are we doing on time got about 10 minutes 10 minutes excellent talk fast, talk fast. <laughs> i'm just kidding i'm kidding i'm sorry <laughs> We're looking at number five, one of my favorite trends. And, and I don't know if this one has I started this in 2023. So if anyone's keeping up, you can go back and watch 2023, 2024, 2020, uh, uh, 22, 22, 23, 24. I think I've done three of these uh, trends. Uh, and that's a trailer out for 2025. 20, uh, uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but here we go for 2024, the last trend that I want, you, want us to focus on is the integration of change management and project management. This says versus really, let's just think through the differences between the two. Obviously change project management is about getting the system ready for the organization. And even in today's environment, there are still opportunities 
for people to learn this, that change management is about getting the organization ready for the system. One is the technology and the other one is the people aspect. And they are both vitally important, but there is an art and a science to making change management happen, right? Getting individuals to go from point A to point B to achieve those business results. We're not doing this just to sing kumbaya and hold hands and make people feel good. It's about business results. That's why I fall so hard on that data-driven decision-making where we have all things related to change management be driven by some tangible result that, that shows uh, uh, an outcome based on our engagement in a project. So it's important for us to understand that you know, when, when project management is launched, the change management should be launched at the same time. I had the opportunity to speak with a, um, a potential client just the other day, and we showed them a, 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 a timeline. Uh, and it had change management at the beginning of the project. And one question was, well, why would change management start that early? And well, the first bullet says start early. That's why. Because Change management is important. If we're going to collect that analytical data that allows us to shape our change plans, to shape our change interventions, to mitigate risk, to determine where the gaps are, to leverage those enthusiasm, we have to find that out early in the process. So there's no more waiting for change management to come on board uh, once the project kicks off. Change management needs to be there at the beginning stages of the project. So you can develop that change plan that aligns with the project plan. The change goals align with the project goals. The roles and responsibilities are clearly defined of who's doing what from a, uh, from a project execution perspective. Uh, I have the opportunity to, to work with some outstanding project managers. And these project managers will, will sit down and we'll have our sessions and we talk through uh, the planning of the change management activities, and and they will put those in the um, in the uh, project plan. So now we have an integrated project plan that shows all the change management activities that that need to occur, and and that person is monitoring those as they uh, monitor the rest of the project. Now it's at a high level. The details are in the in in the change management plan, but at a high level, all the change management activities are in the project plan or the, uh, that that the project manager uses to to manage the 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 uh, engagement the integration of communications plan i'm finding out also that change management kind of plays a dual role sometimes the communication needs to occur internal to the project if anybody notices that raise your hand i can't see it but you can raise your hand um it, and then there's the external communication that needs to occur for the impacted uh users of the system those both levels of communication are important, and it's, it's it's key to ensure that all communication plans are integrated, and that sometimes we have to take on a role of of managing the communication within the project itself. Change management is always should always be a part of the status reporting. Uh, the same uh, uh, project manager that I was speaking of earlier earlier has a, a line item for change management. So when we're walking through the the uh, uh, status of the technology uh, uh, solution. We got all the functional people talking about their their input and what's going on in their worlds. Change management has has a place in that as well, and there's regular check ins that occur. Uh, the change management risk should be a part of the project management risk. It shouldn't be separate because risk to adoption is risk to the project being successful. So if we're not managing that and it doesn't have the purview of the right people. Let's say the the risk log or or the risk uh, and issues um, documentation rolls up to the steering committee. You want those people readiness metrics to be there to ensure that that those risks can be managed uh, as well. And that leads right into the last bullet: establish those metrics for success. Not only are the project management metrics uh, should be in place, but the change management metrics should be there as well to ensure that the project is successful, both from a technology implementation perspective and a people readiness perspective as well. Vitally important. So here they are for 2024, the trends brought to you by the self-proclaimed GOAT. <laughs> Digital transformation and agile methodologies, employee-centric approach, data-driven decision-making, hybrid workforce management, and integration of change management with project management are the trends that I'm leaving you with today. If you have any questions, 
any thoughts. Uh, I'm easily uh, found. Uh, I have some uh, uh, links uh, out on LinkedIn. Uh, and I'm just, I can be found, right? So if you have any questions, any concerns, any thoughts, please share. We do have a question, um, a couple questions coming through um, that um, if you can answer for a second. Oh, absolutely. I'm not going anywhere. I'm right here. Okay. All right. All right. So there is a question from Amanda and um, I don't believe you covered this, but um, are there recommendations for communication strategies for agile versus waterfall, et cetera? Yes, they are. What I initially do is um, I, I will do the analysis of the project and establish the strategies and the communication approaches and even the vehicles. And I, I treat each iteration in the agile methodology as its own little project. So I will have communication plan execution for sprint one. And though that communication will only be associated with the functionality that's being deployed in that particular sprint. And then I do the change impact analysis. So I go a step further. The change impact analysis uh, would only be for sprint one. It only looks at those pieces of functionality, those business processes, that technology that's only being developed into that one sprint is only focusing on that. So you get that education, you get that knowledge share, you take people up that continuum for each sprint. So what I, I do is, I, as I stated uh, just now, I, I treat each sprint as its own little project. It has its own little communication effort, its own uh, change impact analysis. So you can document the what's in it for me uh, uh, information and start sharing that uh, out to the organization. And it, it could be just a subset of folks that are affected by the that uh, pe those pieces of functionality. It may not be the whole organization. So that's how I uh, separate out and and use the uh, the communication planning and execution in an agile uh, deployment model. Okay, um, just want to be aware of time. I have one more question. I think you already covered it, but maybe we could cover it again. Somebody said that the OCM slide that there was a lot of, there was a robust amount of analysis with uh, in depth with data, and just wanted to know how someone can go about collecting it. Uh, to get those kinds of results. And I think we did cover it, but if you just want to reiterate that. Yes, yes. For that particular slide that I shared, I use a, a tool that's um, uh, the, the organization that provides that that actual tool itself is called OCM Solutions. And I've been working with them over the last probably four years now, uh, actually helped shape some of the the new functionality that they have today, because when they initially rolled it out, there were some opportunities to make this thing so robust. And now their system is pretty impressive in terms of collecting that data and having it uh, depicted in a manner that you saw uh, on the slide. Uh, not only is the data important to collect, the data is the, how you present and project the data and share the data is just as important. And I'm big on graphics and, and, and then showing actions and results, action to results uh, that lead to people taking ownership uh, of the change. So great question. OCM Solutions is the tool that I use, one of the tools that I use. Great. Perfect. I want to be, we are at the end of today's presentation. Perfect timing, Julian. Um, I want to take uh, just a minute to say thank you for presenting today. As always, it's such a lovely time together. Um, and I also want to thank everybody who attended today. I hope you found value and enjoyed the time um, you spent uh, with us today. We hope you'll visit us again um, at one of our upcoming webinars. So be sure to visit GP Strategies website to view our future sessions. And I wish everyone on the call today a wonderful and productive rest of your day. Thank you all again. Thank you all for uh, spending your time with me. And I really appreciate the opportunity to share my knowledge and information in these sessions. So thank you once again. Thank you. Have a great day, Julian. Bye-bye. This webinar was brought to you by GP Strategies. Together, we help organizations transform through their people. You can access more webinars or download additional resources by visiting the GP Strategies resource library. The link is on your screen and in the description.